Okay, so it's time. So I'm very happy that we are having Barbara here today from the Mozilla Foundation working for Firefox Mobile, right? Yep, that's right. And, but today she's going to give us some tips on how we can make our websites fast. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. All right, uh, so yeah, welcome. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the book that I wrote this year. Uh, but first I want to draw some attention to uh, how great I think uh, Stockholm uh, uh, at the ABBA Museum. And I hope that says hello, friends. I hope that's the translation. Don't make me say it. Uh, only after a few beers, maybe tonight. Um, a big thing is I want to kind of point out that we have a disclaimer here. So what I will be doing today is probably I will say a lot about, well, you can read more about in this book. Um, uh, and why is that? Well, because I want to make the big bucks, right? That's why I'm here. I want to sell the book to all of you guys. No, I'm joke aside. Um, it's just too much work. Uh, it's, it's just too much content, obviously, to 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 you know form uh, into th 30 minutes or 40 minutes. So um, there wouldn't be much value in buying the book if I could tell you or read the book out in 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Is it worth the money to write a book? Eh. Not sure, I don't think so, or oh, at least not yet for me. Um, so what I did, did here, in case anybody ever wanted to write a book, I used um, Git, uh, GitHub to commit all my um, my edits. And um, this is Git stats, and it kind of shows you uh, how I was writing. And that's pretty much what I also had set up to do. So it took me about 240 days to write it. Um, you can see that most of my writing was done on a Tuesday. I didn't plan that, but I guess that's how, that's how, how it went. So that, those are basically commits that I made. Um, and then you can see, and that kind of um, uh, goes back to what I always had planned, is I, I most of the time I wrote before uh, work. So you can see I committed between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning, because that's, again, where I wrote most of the time. Uh, and obviously a lot of weekends reading. Um, that's enough uh, about that. Um, Let's start with, uh, yeah, with the uh, with uh, the first part, which is you want to start within the company to shape performance culture. So it's not um, necessarily that we're diving right into the code right now uh, and to look for performance, um, but it most of the time starts with the people who make the decisions, right? You get maybe marketing to tell you, well, you should put this ad in or, or whatever, and then you have to kind of argue around or, or figure out how much that influences your website. But how do you shape uh, a culture of performance? First and foremost is, you have to make everybody aware and care about um, performance because it's everybody's business. It's the designer, it's you, the developer, I assume most of you are developers, um, product managers, content strategists, all those people. You also should feel empowered and encouraged to say no. So if there's something that comes your way that you have to implement, don't, don't feel shy, don't, don't think you cannot say no to it, at least rather, you know, um, argue or show what the impact could be. And I'm going to show you what I call a performance point system later on that helps you, especially talking to designers and talking to, to people who might not know a lot about code. And, of course, once you've actually gone to a point where you're, 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 you, you've made some progress and some, su some success, celebrate it. Um, Etsy, textbook example for uh, pushing and forming a performance of culture. What they do is every month, they uh, list or, or announce a performance hero. So somebody in their team who did something really great um, that could help them uh, uh, be faster. They also say, uh, say uh, uh, sell uh, performance hero stickers on their Etsy page as well. And what I really like is they're very transparent. And that's not only good for... Um, you know, all of us to see what they're doing, but also for them, uh, because you have some sort of a guarantee to quarterly bring out a report that says, hey, we've gotten faster. So it's a very good focus and a very good idea of, um, uh, as I said, not only um, getting, getting your stuff done inside, but also being responsible for the public to show that. The magic formula in my mind is um, performance is perception and respect. So perception is not really what we can change because we all have a very subjective um, uh, perception of speed and 
the world that we live in. Uh, but we can control respect, I find. Um, because the greater respect you show to your customer or to your users, the more likely they experience satisfaction and are happy. Um, so show respect to your visitors um, by avoiding any unnecessary delays to your website. And um, I believe and I hope each of the websites that you create or deal with, uh, they should have a goal. Right? Um, so most of the time you, uh, you want the user to perform a task on your website. So maybe even start with counting the steps, how long it takes somebody to get the schedule of you know, the train station or, or, or put something in a shopping cart. That's a good st uh, start as well and uh, start discussing with your user experience team. And ideally, treat speed as a feature. That's I think should be part of our daily lives now. Um, also optimize from a user's perspective. We all sit probably in offices that have really, really high, high speed internet connections and you load a page and it looks really fast and you're like, hey, that's great. Um, but look where your users are coming from. Uh, they might not have those high speed internet connections. Um, use RUM, which is real user monitoring. Um, this is also explained in the book. So here's my first shout out. Um, you should read the book, then you know more about this. Um, and Let's start with, with, with the first step, which is normally wireframing, right? So you have your designers at wireframe. Uh, let's start with wireframing for performance. So here I'm going to introduce uh, to you the performance point system. Again, this is uh, explained in more detail in the book. Um, not every designer is a coder, um, and that's totally fine. They don't have to. Um, so you have to kind of find a way to bridge between those two professions. And I've noticed a lot of the times that you, you need to make sure that designers understand uh, uh, performance implications. So let's start with this example. This is taken by web page, te web page test, a great um, performance tool um, that helps you visualize how long it takes um, for different steps to load on your page. So I took time.com as an example. So this is, you know, a time.com landing page. We have the hero image. We have, you know, some, some stock ticker. We have some video on the right side um, and some ads at the left, uh, left uh, bottom. Um, let's reverse this back into a wireframe in, in our minds and in our brains. So when you slowly go back, that's what I did. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, we have a, above the fold, then we have the stock ticker, we have, you know, an ad. So I kind of, as I said, reversed this. Um, and then I looked at what kind of things start loading after three seconds or, you know, based on that film strip that you saw at the beginning, after 5.7 seconds. So slowly everything comes in that the user can see. And after 7.5 seconds around that time, uh, we're done. So if we look at all those graphical elements that you saw on the page um, and how they're being loaded, um, you can kind of guesstimate how long it will take for certain items of, that, um, of those elements to load. Um, and you can correlate that back to, to the performance impact it has. So what I did here is um, I kind of tried to separate those elements into low impact, meaning small images, stuff that loads fast, um, then medium impact, give that points, in this case two, uh, medium-sized images, simple scripts, and then the bad ones, the high impact ones, which are large images, third-party scripts, a lot of stuff that uh, you either have influence over or um, you have to just pay attention to. So um, as you can see, what I did here, I used a bunch of different shades of gray. So it's not 50 shades of gray, it's just three shades of gray. So we have the big image is, is very uh, large. We have the ad. Um, all that stuff is, is, um, has high impact, so the dark gray. Um, now what I did is I circled the order in which they're loaded. So this is what you saw at the beginning. You have one, two, three, four, five, so all over the place. Um, but you would think certain elements of your page, especially above the fold, are very important to load first because I assume breaking news, you want um, specific things of your website to load right away um, and not necessarily, you know, the magazine specific, the number two here. So with this performance point system in the, um, the MPM, you can probably get a better agreement and understanding with user, your user experience team, what needs to go above the fault um, and then prioritize based on that. 
so here's a suggestion. Su su uh, suggestion. <laughs> so you have the menu, uh, which is important because you want your user to browse right away, right away. And then two would be your your you know your blurb and your image because again this is what you want to have the user read right away. And you know to have more of those exercises, I'm going into that or I'm going into more detail in the book, so you can read that. Um, let's now move on to some code and some numbers. Um, so measure first and optimize and keep repeating that. We've heard already about the performance budget and I think that's a great idea. So the performance budget, what that is, is basically it, you establish a goal to work towards. So you set a baseline basically by comparing your performance result most of the time also to your competitors or to previous versions of your page. Uh, you can use web page test, you can use page speed. Um, to do this because I think it's very important to look at your competitors. As you can tell, the wise learn many things from their enemies. So again, an example I took from the book, um, I love shopping at, I'm not getting any, 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 uh, any money for that, but I love shopping at, at the Gap, uh, uh, yeah, but sorry, Banana Republic and J. Crew. And, um, as an example, you know, you put those two websites next to each other, you, you use web page test, and all of a sudden you see um, huge differences, I would almost say. Um, and there's also uh, one thing which is called speed index. Um, and that is a measurement or a value you could or should look out for to, to kind of compare yourself, not only necessarily the bytes or the, the time that it loads. So speed index is, uh, was introduced by web page test in 2012. And the smaller the number, the better the site per site's performance is. The other one is Page Street. It's Google's answer to Speed Index. Um, and here it's um, Google kind of says, okay, if you have 85 or higher, um, um, then your website is performing well. That's their assumption. Or Speed Curve, which is very, uh, it's a very great tool. Uh, has a has a um, I think a free version as well, but you obviously can pay for subscription as well. Um, and Steve Souders um, moved there recently and is a big part of um, um, this company. And you can tell or you can imagine when Steve Souders is somewhere, there are probably some great stuff coming out. So you should definitely check that out. Let's move on to the browser. Um, so we talked about measuring, um, but it's definitely worth looking also how the browser renders a page. So let's look at this graph here. So rendering. Rendering is the process of displaying uh, the re requested content in the browser window. So that's the primary function of the browser. You have HTML, you're parsing the HTML and that leads to the construction of the DOM, the, the document object model. And it's a tree structure that describes the elements of the page. And then you have CSS at the bottom, which is render blocking. So the browser needs to load all CSS files prior to rendering the content. And then we have the CSS OM um, object model. And the browser also has to process the style sheets in order to understand how these elements um, in the DOM should be displayed. And refer to this, as I mentioned, to uh, this uh, CSS object model. And then JavaScript, um, which adds basically the power to manipulate and interact with the DOM. Uh, and then causing basically the, the render tree to change. And JavaScript is render blocking, um, so when used synchronously. So if you use it asynchronously, asynchron then you're not uh, blocking the rendering. And I think Tobias had also mentioned stuff about that. Uh, and then last but not least is the well, the render tree or the, the render tree basically combines the content and style information of the entire visible uh, content on the, stream, uh, on the screen. Then we want to determine um, the critical rendering path. Um, so we just described the rendering path itself, but it's very important to now look at the critical rendering path and what it is. So the critical rendering path describes the code and resources um, that are required to render the initial view of the page, or as you can say, the visible part, so everything above the fold. Um, so let's, I'm gonna read a few of those slides because I don't wanna uh, forget too much. Um, so let's start with number one. So on the left side, you see a very simple um, um, HTML sample page where I load uh, I just say hello friends and then I have my, my uh, hero image and then I have a map that I load. 
Um, so the browser begins to construct the DOM, and after it receives the HTML, or after it has received the HTML, and that's also when the browser actually discovers the link tag, as you can see at the top with the style sheets, and sends that request to retrieve this CSS. And then number two, the CSS object model can only build when the CSS has arrived, which is why the CSS is render blocking. So the DOM building can't be finished because JavaScript has not been parsed. So let's look at that. Once the CSS arrives, the browser can build the CSS object model, which then unblocks the JavaScript. And now the JavaScript loads, unblocks the DOM to finish. And then the browser will merge the DOM and the CSS DOM in the render tree. And finally, the browser can complete uh, the layout and paint steps. Um, teaser alert again. Um, so in the book, what I did is um, I have I created a very simple um, web page with a hero image and a bunch of dog images, and um, I um, kind of ran like try to improve my critical rendering path. And there are amazing bookmarklets out there that help you to look through your page and kind of create. Uh, CSS, um, inline CSS that you can then put in at the head of your um, um, your website and it um, improves the, uh, the load time. And that's what I did. Um, so um, I have here at the top is without the critical rendering path optimization and at the bottom it's with the critical rendering um, path optimization. And you can tell um, speed index uh, already dropped by half. Um, meaning it's it's very good um, because it's a lower number. Um, and look at the start render time because this is exactly what we wanted to do, right? It's the initial load, it's the critical rendering path. I dropped this to 0 0.7 seconds. Um, and I think, again, this is not rocket science. I used a bookmarklet to do this. I didn't, I didn't do much about this. If you don't believe me, <laughs> you can see how it loads. You see it's way faster. So how do you determine your critical rendering path? So again, or w what can you do? Uh, the page itself is always a critical resource. So keep your HTML as, as, as clean as possible. Clean up your DOM by removing any unused uh, elements. They just delay the rendering process. Um, order matters where you put things. Don't put third-party features or scripts um, or web fonts in your critical uh, path. Um, Load only critical assets as, as early as possible. And then um, think about the 14 kilobyte rule. Who here has heard of the 14 kilobyte rule? Okay, good. Um, so that means um, you want to serve the most important content first. And um, you need to do this within your first round trip that you're doing uh, to the server and back. And we know that only 14 kilobytes of the HTML can be transferred before a new round trip. So you want to put as much as possible in that 14K that you have available. Um, so in order to improve your start, start rendering time, um, that's what you have to do. So what do you, what do you <coughs> how can you do this? Um, focus on the above the fold content first and load other uh, assets uh, uh, afterwards. CSS is critical, as we said. Remove render blocking CSS. Um, the most important styles especially above the fold, they should go online. Unblock the parser by, un, uh, by using attributes such as defer or async uh, for JavaScript uh, scripts, and in general, put the scripts, if possible, at the bottom of the page to avoid uh, render blocking. Next one is um, reduce bytes. Um, and you can tell by, as I'm going through those chapters of my book or how I focus on certain things, it's kind of I'm following, obviously, the rules also that Steve Souders had, had, had put out there. So again, this is not, um, this is not um, super crazy stuff. Um, minify your page assets, um, such as HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Um, biggest optimization results, you can we, you can get, uh, as also Tobias obviously showed us, um, by uh, you know optimizing images. Um, there's a good chance that you can heavily optimize things. Use PNG GIFs or JPEGs or SVG or, or wh whatever it is, but at least look at it. There's there's a lot of optimization uh, opportunities in there. Um, and you know images are your best friend, but can also be your uh, your worst enemy. Um, avoid custom fonts. I'm personally 
not a big fan of custom fonts, uh, web fonts, um, because again, they're, they're very heavy and not done properly. They can also very much slow down the rendering time. Uh, use gzip te techniques to reduce the file size that is sent over the wire. Um, and um, yeah, the book also goes into some of the uh, compressions and some examples that I did in comparison, and you can see um, what, what might work best for you in certain situation of the image. Reduce HTTP requests, not something you should uh, ignore. Um, concatenate where applicable. So that means, what I think is always impor important is you should separate the more frequently changed, uh, the more frequently changed code from the less frequently changed code. Concatenate files based on these criteria. Um, and for certain ones that are not being changed that often, use a very aggressive cache policy because you know, certain files of your page will most likely not be uh, um, changed uh, so often. Don't blind, blindly use uh, JavaScript libraries and frameworks. I'm guilty myself. I think it's always very easy to just quickly plug something in and say, yeah, I'll, I'll just try it out and then later on I'm going to change it or optimize it. You, most of the time you don't do that. Um, image sprites always still something we can do uh, uh, for uh, to reduce HTTP requests. Um, data URIs, I've played around with data URIs as well, and I've seen some great uh, improvements. You have to make sure those there are certain criteria you should or you should not be using data URIs, especially when your source file is small, a certain size, you can, you, you can do that. Um, fight latency, uh, very important, especially also uh, for mobile, which I'll go into in a second. So latency is, 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 is the time that it takes for the content to be requested by and send to your browser. And latency can vary. So um, it is affected by the distance uh, the data has to travel and the medium that it conducts it. So you experience higher, ex higher uh, latency, um, particular, as I mentioned, on mobile networks. And why is that? Because the radio of your device uh, needs to first find the closest tower to basically con communicate and establish a connection with first. And if the device is idle, it even can take longer. So reduce HTTP requests as much as possible. The highest latency occurs on mobile devices. Um, reduce the amount of polling on your page. So don't constantly try to fetch new co content if it's not really necessary, um, especially if it, yeah, it's not immediately needed. And uh, the 14 kilobyte rule, send the most important styles um, down the wire as soon as you can. Remove redirects because they require another DNS lookup, which takes another, another uh, a few hundred milliseconds. Keep a live header. Um, that is a very good uh, header you can set as well to, to um, keep TCP connections open. Uh, offline storage, still probably a little bit, uh, I, I still find uh, difficult to implement or, or, or to use properly. Um, content delivery networks. Um, you know, that's the CDN um, is, can be very helpful to speed up your website as well um, because you basically um, move, you know, the requested resources closer to your, your user and that's why you also reduce the round trip. And HTTP2, and I think Andy is talking about that um, later, which is a great improvement of the web. Um, uh, which was yeah um, formerly uh, called Speedy, and um, you should definitely t check out his his um, talk about that as well. Make friends with the server, or at least have somebody who knows how the server works and how t how to manage it. Um, Gzip is um, you can use to, uh, to um, have uncompressed assets such as you know HTML and XML, JSON, and CSS. Um, very easy. Um, I literally, I mean, there's an HTML boilerplate um, setup where um, you can get your server config files are all set up in that HTML boilerplate, which you can find on GitHub as well. Um, and literally what I did here is I just literally add another um, line in my uh, web server uh, config file, and all of a sudden GZIP was enabled. Um, and you can see also here again what a, what a great difference it makes, but just you know, adding something small like this to your, your configuration. So don't don't miss out those small little opportunities. They're so they give you so much great impact. And cache. So create a solid cache policy. 
use conditional requests, so content-based or time-based, so depending on what kind of content you show should be more heavily cached versus content that needs to be fresh, um, then time-based also, um, you know, certain things, yeah, don't change too much. Um, obviously, the cache doesn't apply to new visitors, so cache only hits when you um, um, uh, when you're a reoccurring uh, visitor. Here, as an example, also from the book, so this is you can you can you can set this up if you don't have all the the server rights on your server, uh, you can just create an HT access um, uh, file. Uh, what I did here is so I have a horrible work. WordPress blog, and um, a lot of the times, all well, the content changes, um, as in like blog posts. But for example, my hero image or um, my style sheets, they probably don't don't change that much. So what I did here is, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I normally write maybe every two or three months a new blog post. So um, I could set um, that that main directed two months just to be on the safe side. And <clears throat> for example, my uploads, so my images or PDFs that I put in that in that blog, um, they uh, rarely change. So I set it to a year. Um, so again, this is just an example. You you figure out your policy um, on your on your website and assets that you have, how frequently they ch those change. But again, here you see <coughs> load time, start, render time, speed index, all that stuff improved by just adding a bit of cache intelligence and cache policy to it. Also, it's you just have to take the time, think about it, set it up, and then it's done. And tame the mobile beast. Um, be respectful of your users' data, charges on mobile. Um, unfortunately, we still live in a world of roaming where, where companies <laughs> take a lot of money from us if we, if we roam on a different uh, country. So don't make the user pay for your bad performance. That's just not nice. Um, also think about different um, mobile strategies. You've probably heard of responsive web designs, the M dot, you know, scenario. Um, then uh, res um, responsive web development server side components. So you do like a like a combination of that. Or what I had done in the past also <coughs> res with ESI. Um, ESI is uh, something. It occurs at the edge of the the, the the your your content delivery network and it's faster than putting the the um, the, the stuff uh, in front of the user. Um, yeah. Remember, mobile devices are powered by batteries. So they, if you have a lot of JavaScript, a lot of big images, it probably or it will drain the battery of your users. They might not want to visit your page because they have too much stuff on it, um, and your competitor's website is, you know, way lighter when it comes to batteries because we all face the challenge still of our mobile devices not probably lasting a day. Um, consider offline storage techniques. And uh, also test your mobile experience on real devices. Also something we always, I find, ignore because we just quickly test again in our office with a high-speed internet. Oh, it looks good, it loads fast. No, not really. Look at um, the real user monitoring um, or the, your, your data from your, your users and see uh, with what kind of bandwidth and connections they come into your site, onto your site. And automate your performance routines, um, which I think is great and I love it. Um, I've used task runners such as Grunt and Gulp. You probably heard some of them before. Those help you in not worrying too much about certain things, but rather automating them by based on looking, you know, through the code. Um, you can apply filters and and, and, and even uh, uh, warnings. Um, eBay um, has done a great. I think what did it? Yeah, eBay. Um, they have a continuous integration uh, plugin um, or a continuous integration tool created that when you do certain things to your, your um, web page, such as maybe including third-party scripts, and you're not doing it the proper way, uh, the continuous integration fails, and you can't build further. So you, the, their, their, the continuous integration encouraged the developer to actually fix their, fix their issues, also specifically around uh, web performance. And that's what I did as well. So in the book, I'm going through a complete example of having a very dumb website um, with a lot of bad stuff in it, not optimized images, bad script tags, um, you know, loading certain things not properly in terms of the, the, the rendering path. And um, when you actually plug in Grunt uh, and let your, your website build, 
um, it optimizes all of this for you, um, concatenate scripts and all that stuff. And again, here you see without magic and with magic, obviously without magic would be the one, the, the old one. Um, I might have not um, increased the page speed score so much, but you can see when you start the re start render time in a fully loaded time, I improved some stuff there as well. Again, this is not, I didn't have to manually do anything. I just let it run, a tool run on my website to, to improve that. Avoid the yo-yo effect, um, which is basically, right, you lose weight and then you gain it right back. And that's a very common thing of especially diets. Um, so I kind of see that the same happening uh, for web performance as well and big bloated websites. Um, and in order to avoid that, you should constantly measure and monitor your stuff. I had the pleasure, or maybe not pleasure, uh, when I was uh, working at the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, we had this happening where um, we everything was going smoothly. We had like five or six seconds load time on the mobile website, and then all of a sudden there was a spike, uh, and we encountered, I think, 10 seconds of load time. So we got a warning, and then we investigated, and um, thankfully we were able to uh, pick that up very qu quickly and um, yeah, find the error, remove the error, and everything was, was good. So if we hadn't had that those warning uh, mechanisms in there, we probably wouldn't have um, had the chance and we would have gained that, that um, weight back. All right, and I think this is kind of, I want to leave you with a quote um, that um, Larry Page, so one of Google's founders said, and I think if, if you kind of use that every day when you build websites to think about that, I think it gives you good inspiration um, and encouragement to, uh, to get faster. So unfortunately, because I was traveling and I only have 21 kilograms allowance, baggage allowance, I could unfortunately not bring uh, too many books with me or at least not, well, just one for Peter. Um, so if you, <laughs> oops. <laughs> um, so if you wanna, and I apologize that I couldn't really bring uh, any, any books. Um, so there is a $25 off ebook uh, uh, discount that you can apply. So if you're interested in the book, um, and if you want to buy it, and that's the last sales pitch that I'm making today, um, you can go to leanwebsitesbbinto.me and uh, you can order it from there. That's it. Any questions? Um, is Mozilla eating its own dog food? So is Mozilla keeping its websites fast and lean? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I have to say. No, um, what, what kind of websites are you just like Mozilla.org, like all those, those standard? Um, yes, like the, yeah, they're, um, I mean, I haven't checked it since I started there because I'm working on the mobile stuff or the, the browser itself, not the web, web pages. Um, but I can tell you from uh, the inside when it comes to performance and making also the browser fast to allow, you know, to support all those standards that help you to, to get faster, Mozilla and Firefox is heavily working on that, yes. Anyone else? Uh, culture, I always think culture is hard when you, I'm a consultant, I come into a project, nobody speaks about this, everything is really bad. How long does it take to get people to get it, to actually work for it? That's a, obviously that's an important and heavy question, right? Um, I think I've noticed uh, at the companies I work that uh, convincing people, um, most of the time it's sharing, things like that. I think if, if, if more people hear about it, uh, the better it is showing examples and saying, hey, um, if, if, you, if you care about performance, there is a gain, there is a benefit for your company as well. Because especially, I, I think there are great research studies and great um, articles done about, especially e-commerce websites that, you know, even if, if um, Amazon has whatever, 1.5 seconds faster load time, they make, 
so much more money based on that. So it's again, it, you you put a dollar sign to it, and then you'll you'll uh, you probably get the managers to say, yeah, okay. So um, find those. I think you have to be smart about it. And you have to find those nuances how you can convince management. But it's not always like I'm. I'm not saying this is easy, you, and you can't get it done by tomorrow. So. Designers, I would. Can you repeat, uh, repeat that question? Oh yeah, yeah. The re what, what 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 should be done for designers? How to convince designers? Um, uh, I I, th I personally f felt the example that I uh, gave with the uh, performance point system that really helped for me um, at the CBC where I work. That designers got a better sense of oh okay, so you're telling me if I add those fifteen huge large images to the page, which looks amazing for the user if they have a fast internet connection, um, that way. Uh, I'm hitting a bad performance impact, then I think then you, you reconsider. So I think it's that wireframing stage that you say, um, tell your, 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 your developers, or the developers tell you, uh, work with them. Think about the things that are very important at the top of the page, above the fold, and get that sense of, okay, if I put this, if, if there is a big hero image, either keep it in, but optimize it, um, versus, you know, maybe, make it smaller or something like that. So again, it, 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 I think talk, just talking to developers and saying even if they're not aware of performance implications yet, just say, hey, what do you, just start the conversation. What do you think if I put this, if I put those 15 images above the fold, do you think that's okay for performance? And then this person, the developer can probably go ahead and say, let me prototype this quickly and see how long it, it, it takes to load as an example. Yeah, definitely. So the question was, or the comment was, um, if you have a more performant website, automatically your server uh, load and your 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 uh, all costs that are related to even hosting a, a website will go uh, slower. So of course, that that's a good that's a good argument to have with a manager as well. Um, I mean, nowadays, unfortunately, servers, <laughs> it's very cheap, right? So even if you have a lot of data loaded uh, to them, it probably doesn't uh, increase too much of the um, uh, the fees maybe you have to pay. But um, still, at the end of the day, uh, performance is nothing bad. Being faster is always better. Okay. okay. Thank you, Barbara. You're very so welcome. So you can all go to lunch earlier. <laughs> that was so, uh, I mean, so we have a couple of more minutes, and if it's okay for you, Tobias, if we do, we have any more questions for Tobias? Because I can start first. Then, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, in your talk, uh, how, how, how do you think we should do? Like, we are running a CMS, and and how 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 what's your experience of? So I see uh, we can use the tools you proposed, like. Man, if you're publishing your site manually, but how do you have any experience of using it in a CMS or like how do companies do? Um, so for the most popular CMSs, there are uh, plugins to do image optimization via well user upload. Um, the the biggest issue that people have with these with image optimization tools is that, 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 that they're not instant. So I've seen lots of tools being dissed because they're not fast enough. So they take a couple of seconds to process and then users complain, oh, well, I can't, use, I can't show the Im image instantly after it's being optimized. But the thing is, all you have to think about is an asynchronous queue in that case. So when an editor or somebody in a CMS uploads an image, just take put that into an asynchronous queue Put that, put that on, a, on another machine which can do the optimization for the editor. Show them the unoptimized image for, and for their session. They don't really care. It's just the editor review. They, they're not a user to be converted. And then just show them the, the image they uploaded um, uncompressed because they can work with that now. But then when the image is optimized from the queue, replace it in the background. So that's nothing an editor needs to be exposed to. Forcing your editors to optimize your images manually, for example, that never works out. It's always the human, the human is always the error in the, in the thing. So I'm always going for optimization. 
but make it yeah make it uh, undetectable. So don't make a user wait with a spin off one image to optimize, but just give them a good user experience of yeah, I've uploaded this image now. I can continue working because they're not wait. They, they don't want to. The task is not uploading an image. The task is edit, con edit, uh, edit content. So you have to give them the good user experience that the image is there and the upload is successful. Give them a nice green checkbox. But at the background, have an asynchronous queue that does the work for them so that everybody but the sysadmin can forget about the process being there. Thanks. Anyone else? Hi, uh, one more question. Uh, what kind of experience, uh, and this is to the lady, <laughs> uh, uh, spend the efforts on the server work versus client or the application itself, like upgrading your PHP version, upgrade your database, or work with the application itself? Do you have any feedback on where you can make the most gains? Um, I'm not a server person, so I... I I know that you can do a lot on the server to optimize even the little few examples that I gave you. So I think most of the stuff that I was focusing on was front end. So anything obviously from, you know, hitting the browser to rendering uh, for the client. Um, but yeah, I think I'm sure that there are database queries that you can optimize. Um, I'm sure that there is, I guess, certain PHP versions that you can install and, and load. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I don't think I'm the expert in, in giving you a lot of advice there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so then in a couple of minutes is lunch and then there's the lunch keynote and then it's back here and we will listen to Andy that will talk about HTTP2. So thank you.